Buen día, buenos días. Um, empezamos la segunda mesa redonda de este cuarto foro de la economía del agua, en este caso dedicado, dedicado a la mesa redonda, como saben, a los retos en la regulación. A los retos en la regulación de los servicios de agua y saneamiento desde la perspectiva de la conciliación de los intereses individuales y los objetivos sociales. Antes de entrar en materia, de hecho ya hemos entrado hace rato creo, Uh, déjenme presentarles a los tres ponentes de la mesa redonda, que son de su derecha a su izquierda. En primer lugar, la señora Alena Kosakova, economista en jefe de Love Watt, uh, uh, Love Office of Water Services, ¿no? que es el órgano regulador del agua en Inglaterra y Gales. Antes, Alena Kosakova trabajó como consultora en Frontier, Frontier Economics y también trabajó en las autoridades de la competencia del Reino Unido y de la Unión Europea. Por tanto, su experiencia cubre una amplia gama de áreas siempre relacionadas con la competencia y con la economía de la regulación. Welcome. Eh, Jaime Melo Baptista, Jaime Melo Baptista es presidente del Consejo Estratégico de la Parcería Portuguesa para Agua. ¿no? Uh, el Portuguese Water Partnership, que es una red de organizaciones que promueve sinergias entre los diferentes sectores, del, eh, entre los diferentes actores del sector e intenta potenciar al máximo su desarrollo. Antes, sin embargo, entre 2013 y 2015, fue el presidente de la Autoridad Portuguesa de Regulación de Servicios de Agua y Residuos. Jaime Melo Batista es también ingeniero especializado en, ingenier en ingeniería sanitaria y tiene más de 35 años de experiencia en el sector del agua, donde ha en el cual ha jugado distintos papeles, papeles. Y es también miembro del Consejo Estratégico de la Asociación Internacional del Agua. Bienvenido. Bien, uh, y Francesc Trillas, en tercer lugar, es profesor agregado del Departamento de Economía Aplicada de la Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, investigador del Instituto de Economía de Barcelona y también del Centro Sector Público Sector Privado del IES. Se doctoró en Economía en el Instituto Universitario Europeo de Florencia y es también licenciado en Historia. Antes de su carrera académica, fue regidor, fue concejal del Ayuntamiento de Barcelona por el PSC entre 1991 y 1995. Pero lo más importante de todo es que es experto en economía de la regulación. Uh, tengo entendido que, sobre todo, uh, tiene uh, aportaciones notables en el sector de las telecomunicaciones. Bienvenido. Bienvenido. Uh, como digo, yo creo que la mesa anterior ha hecho ya la introducción de nuestra mesa, es la continuación lógica. Um, no, no les digo nada de nuevo, por lo tanto, uh, si les comento que en estos momentos hay mucha gente, um, discúlpenme, cambio de tercio, mucha gente en estos momentos opina que la, la política en este país está judicializada y se buscan en los tribunales de justicia soluciones a problemas, a problemas políticos. Hay mucha gente que lo piensa y también piensa que es una situación anómala. Bien, pues será porque no se han fijado en el sector del agua. Eh, en Cataluña al menos sí que está judicializado. Eh, si alguien se dedica a contar los conflictos que tenemos en los tribunales, seguramente se sorprenderá, porque hay muchos, y hay muchos y algunos importantes. Y es que creo que también se buscan en la, en los, en la justicia, en los tribunales, las soluciones a problemas derivados de la falta de regulación, o por culpa de una regulación ya obsoleta. Por lo tanto, Houston tenemos un problema. Um, en fin, uh, creo que lo mejor es que ellos tres nos ayuden a encontrar soluciones y pensar cómo, cómo encaramos el futuro. Please, go ahead. You first, Alena. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, 
I have to disappoint you to start with, because I'm not the chief executive of oh. Ofwat. I'm the chief <laughs> economist. Chief executive is my boss, Catherine Ross, um, who I understand was here in Barcelona at a conference in November and enjoyed it very much. Okay. Um, Excuse me. <laughs> don't worry. Um, it feels very good to be called chief executive. Um, I thought that I'll start by explaining a little bit about the UK um, system, because it's quite different to other uh, water industries. Um, we have three different regulators in the UK. Um, I represent Off Watt, which is the water regulator for England and Wales. Uh, we look after 53 million um, water customers in England and 3 million water customers in Wales. Um, we have a separate regulator in Scotland, which looks after over 5 million Scottish customers. And we have a, a regulator in Northern Ireland, which looks after about 2 million customers. The Northern Irish um, regulator combines uh, gas and electricity as well. Um, in the UK, we have um, eight water-only companies. These are companies that provide just water, and 10 water and sewerage companies. Um, which means that geographically they overlap because everybody needs both water and, and sewerage in their homes. Um, our history is slightly different to, to other systems. We had a very similar system to many continental countries until about 1950s, although probably always a bit more aggregated. We had over 1,000 munis municipal um, companies. And from the 1950s to the end of 1980s, we saw a process of consolidation. And by the end of the 1980s, we ended up with around 30 quite large companies that were operating across large chunks of the, the British territory. Um, we then had a process of privatization. I think that also sets us apart. The UK is actually really keen on public services being run privately. But it doesn't mean that we just hand over um, public assets to private hands. We then have to have a corresponding strict regulatory regime that makes sure that these um, monopolies, which are often natural monopolies, are properly regulated. We do that through periodic reviews. So we are now gearing up for our next periodic review, which will be concluded at the end of uh, 2019. Um, we, we also have this strong belief that whilst water is has lots of elements of public good and has lots of positive externalities it also is a product like any other and it needs to be regulated and if you look at it dispassionately you can realize that actually you can introduce markets quite deeply into different elements of this natural monopoly which is slightly smaller than it originally looks. And that was behind the, the drive for privatization at the end of the 1980s and the, the regulatory model that we have now. Um, I think it's important to say that off what is part of a wider regulatory framework. Um, if you look at my background, I've just recently joined with a sort of generalist um, regulatory background. Um, six months ago, I was looking after um, healthcare mostly. Um, this is very common in the, in the UK. A lot of people who work for Ofwat have joined us from Ofgem, which is the gas and electricity regulator. Some have left us to join the financial services regulator. So there is this community of regulatory economists and lawyers that is quite porous. It also means that there is this established system of uh, sector regulation where water is just one of the many sectors that we regulate in one particular way. Um, we are also part of a sort of wider regulatory landscape, which involves the Environment Agency, which sets um, environmental standards. Um, as you know, a lot of these standards are set internationally, and they, they would come um, at the moment from the European Union, um, which we then implement. And for us at Ofwat, which is the economic regulator for water, we just take them as given. Um, then um, we have the Drinking Water Inspectorate, which is looking after the quality of water. Again, they set standards which we take as given. Um, we then have two governments that are looking after us. We have our home department, which is the Department of Environment um, and um, Rural Affairs and Agriculture. They are very much um, focused on 
um, providing that overarching policy guidance to us, but we are an independent economic regulator, um, so they cannot easily overrule us. Um, so in the area where we have been given um, our um, rights and statutory duties, we have quite a lot of freedom and cannot easily be overruled. Um, that said, um, the Welsh Government and the and DEFRA for, um, for the England side of things will give us what they call strategic policy statements and they are in the process of issuing them now where they say we know that you have your legal duties enshrined in the Water Act 1991 which established you um, but there are certain things that we would like you to think about in addition to those because these are things that matter to, uh, matter to us. So we know for example that um, in England there, is a, there continues to be a huge push of, for the use of markets and competition as deep in the network as possible, whilst the Welsh government is considerably more sceptical about the use of competition, and it had a direct impact on the way we regulated. So we had a choice, for example, whether to open the business um, retail market for water, and we made a decision to open it only in England, not in Wales. We continue to regulate, to price regulate um, um, Welsh water companies. Um, whilst in England, we have just opened the biggest retail market in water in the world where um, every business customer in the UK can now choose their water supplier. Actually, it's very recent. We opened it on the 1st of April. Um, so I think that's kind of useful background to where we sit and how we compare to, um, uh, to other jurisdictions. We have very, a very clear set of duties in the sort of in the world of regulators of water. Um, on our side of the fence, we have to look after customers. We treat uh, water users as customers. Um, we look at the efficiency of the network, trying to ensure that customers get the lowest bill. But it's not the lowest possible bill because we have to take account of the resilience of the network. So think about um, ensuring that companies invest enough in the network so that um, the network is resilient to climate change, to the new environmental standards, but also to the growing demand that we are facing. Um, we also have to ensure security of supply. Um, we have a very interesting regime in that uh, we have to ensure that companies remain financeable so that we don't try to squeeze too much money out of them that they fall over and can't deliver their service. That said, if they do not do their role properly, we can impose a special administration rule on them. So we have quite significant powers to influence what companies are doing. Um, if you look at the list of different duties that we, that we have, they cannot all be achieved to the same degree and we have to, um, we have to make trade-offs. Um, you can't have the maximum level of environment protection and the best reservoirs to deal with um, extreme droughts and the lowest bills that just doesn't go together. So we have to come to a, a rounded decision. We are not taking this decision normally on our own, in particular when it comes to investment. There is this, um, there is a water resource management plan that we agree um, together with the Environment Agency and you will see that there are lots of debates um, about which view should prevail. We um, we represent the economic efficiency view, so we will be challenging vigorously any um, suggestion that a new reservoir needs to be built. We are going to be asking, do we really need to build this reservoir? Is it in the best interest of customers? And um, the Environment Agency will obviously has, have different views. They will be thinking about sustainability, they will be thinking about um, environmental um, impacts. So there will be a healthy discussion and at the end of it there will be just one water resource management plan on the basis of which we are all going to then carry out our duties. Um, some of these trade-offs are more difficult than others. Um, for example, there are a lot, water is not, you know, the, the very fact that in, in gas and electricity we have one Britain-wide um, regulator, but in water we have two. We have one for England and Wales, one in in Scotland, and even even us, even we have separate sets of guidance principles from both governments. 
suggests that water is politically incredibly sensitive. Um, and um, we have to be really careful um, how we handle those political sensitivities. Um, um, for example, we have a very narrow remit. We have to look at efficiency, but efficiency often means job losses, and job losses mean have a huge impact on local communities. This is not something that we would be able to take into our current um, framework, but it is something that will be in the wider um, wider environment that will be influencing um, political opinion um, and understanding of whether as a regulator we are doing a good job. Um, so we have to be mindful of those things. Social issues are another thing where we have a certain set of obligations, in particular to protect vulnerable customers. But as much as we all agree this is really important, it's actually really quite difficult to do. Um, first, to identify who is vulnerable, who should be protected, is quite difficult. And then deciding how you do it, because if you decide that you are going to impose um, higher price on some customers than on others, you have to be absolutely sure that you're doing it right. Those who are going to bear the higher cost of the infrastructure may not be happy with it. So it's, um, it's actually a really sensitive issue. And I don't know whether many of you have followed um, the, the regulatory um, developments in the UK, but we have recently had a major inquiry into the prices in the gas and electricity sectors. Um, and that came um, on the back of great discontent with the prices of gas and electricity, which were going up and up and up, or there was this perception that they were. And the regulator um, got um, a lot of bad press for it. And in, it tried to do um, many interventions. It ended up referring the market to the Competition and Markets Authority for a thorough investigation. It found that there were some problems in the market, which we are now in the, in the process of fixing. But um, it found two, two interesting um, and two interesting findings. One was that when you open a market, sometimes the most vulnerable people benefit the least um, because they have the least ability to, to, do, to make informed choices. So this is something that we take incredibly seriously in water when we are now opening a market for business retail customers thinking, are we protecting the vulnerable customers, which in our case would be micro businesses, the local coffee shop, as opposed to the large multinational corporation. Um, so that is one thing that we, that we are learning and is of increasing importance in our regime. Markets can sometimes deliver overall parito efficiency, but it may be um, to the detriment of um, some um, uh, small, often vulnerable customers. So that's one important issue that we have, um, we have learned recently. And the other thing is, if you are... A third of the price of gas and electricity are environmental taxes in the UK. And that was, that was the reason why the prices went up. One of the main reasons why, why the prices went up so significantly. Um, so I'm just thinking about the first intervention we had today, that you know, solutions are simple. I mean, I am at the micro end of finding solutions to these problems. And the UK has signed up to um, international treaties and is committed to um, um, uh, to improving environment, but when actually you are putting the money that it costs to improve the environment onto people's bills, you can get into all sorts of trouble um, and it becomes really difficult. Um, so that's, um, that's something that we are learning um, at this moment as well. Um, Elena, what about um, leaving the, the rest of the things to, for the, for the, the, the discussion afterwards? Very because happy. I'm I'm worried about the, the about time. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, um, Jamie Malou. Sure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Great pleasure. I will focus on uh, water <laughs> services. That means water supply, wastewater uh, services, and. Uh, about that, we all know that uh, the situation around the world in many countries is more or less a disaster or a poor situation or in some cases a fair situation. And just in a few countries, we have a quite good uh, situation. This is the reality. And we need to, to understand how to deal with that. And the United Nations said we have those sustainable development goals and one is water. 
six, okay? So the, the, the question for me is how to answer this. And in my opinion, my deep belief is that we only, we countries around the world, we only can deal uh, with this with a sound public policy in each country for those services. But what that means, a sound public policy, okay? Uh, that means for each country to have a clear idea about the strategy. We have in this country, in medium term, this strategy. It, it means to have a, a good legal framework. It, it means to have a sound institutional framework, like you said, for instance, in the UK. Uh, uh, to have defined the targets we, we want to achieve covering population, but also the quality of service. What is that quality of service? What quality of service we, we, we want? To have a sound public uh, tariff policy, to know how to use funding. It's not necessary money, money. it's necessary to, to know how to apply money, which is different. To, uh, for sure, to build a lot of uh, assets, infrastructures, to be efficient at operational point of view, yet at the aggregation point of view. Uh, it's also important capacity building, uh, entrepreneurship in the sector, introduce competition, like you said, uh, the involvement of stakeholders and users, uh, protection of the users, and information. So if you are able to manage all those components, more or less in the same time, and with a holistic approach, you have all the, you pave the way to solve the problem. If you take, think, think about the puzzle, if you feel the puzzle, you are in a very good position to, to solve your problem. But you only make the puzzle with five pieces, you fail. And you have one, one, one only piece uh, of the puzzle saying, this is very important, this is money, I will solve with this, I will uh, tell him you will fail completely, completely. Money is important, but, but if without legislation, institutional, we will fight. So we need a, uh, strong public policies with those components. And what is the role of the regulation here? Regulation is one of the pieces, is part of the institutional framework. But the real importance of uh, regulation is that piece, that component of the puzzle, deals with all the others, controls or surveys all the others. So if that uh, small component fails, probably everything uh, failed. And we did that in Portugal 20, 25 years ag ago. We thought about the public policy, we thought about regulation, we studied the regulation in UK, in Chile, in Australia, and so on. And we decided to go with a new public policy. And we are now 23 years of experience of that. And the results are, uh, let's say, uh, very positive. Let me tell you a few, a few finger, uh, f figures. We moved from 80% of population with public water supply to 95. But regarding quality of that water, we moved from 50% complying with the European directive to 99, which is huge. And on wastewater, we moved from 30% with collection and treatment to 80%, which is not enough, but is very good. And the impact on the rivers was very good. And you, I'm sure you can swim in any beach in Portugal now, which was not true at that time. <laughs> and you can drink water in any tap, which was uh, not true at that time. So the impact was very, very problem. We solved everything? No, we never solved everything. We have problems. We need to invest more in uh, wastewater. We need to solve the tariff problems and the economic sustainability. We need to aggregate more the utilities. Uh, we need to improve mechanisms to deal with the poor population. We need, of course, deal with those challenges, climate change, uh, eco circular economy, everybody needs to, to deal with. And uh, that time, why it was decided to create uh, a regulator? Well, because government at that time understood, I'm changing the policy, understood that component. If I do not have that component, it will be difficult. So the first actor, the first uh, uh, entity understanding the need of regulation was the government, central, central government. But it's interesting to see develop, uh, the development of the regulator over the time. It was a long and difficult uh, 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 trail, okay? Uh, and we had uh, someone decide in 93, we will have a regulator. The regulator appeared in 99, that means six years. 
and the regulator was very fragile till 2003. And the regulator start working with a, lo a lot of limitations and without formal independence till 2009. Mm -hmm. And he only got, uh, uh, in to now, uh, 2009, uh, the regulation of all the utilities, not only the private, but also the public, municipalities. And only in 2014, he got full independence. So you see a long way, very difficult, but also very, let's say, interesting to, to see. And uh, uh, during that per period, he decided to, he, its model, which is different from your model, from model in, Ch in Chile or in Argentina, because each country uh, need to, to think the best solution for, for itself, uh, uh, depending on cult uh, the culture, the context, the, the level of development, and so on. We decide to have a model which is uh, a little bit different from, from of what, which is, well, the regulator have the responsibility regarding all the foreign utilities, water, wastewater, and also solid waste, which is not the case here, and regulate the sector, what we call structural regulation, and regulated utilities, we call it uh, behavioral regulation. Uh, starting with behavior, for each of the four hundred, uh, it was said the regulator must uh, regulate those utilities regarding uh, the, co the compliance with law and contracts, regarding tariffs, economic regulation, regarding quality of service, regarding water quality for human consumption, and regarding the relation between the utilities with the consumers. And that means a lot of huge uh, amount of instruments and methodology, as you know. And, but you, you need also to take care about the structural regulation. That means you need to produce analysis and uh, uh, work uh, f to support government to have a good uh, strategy for sector with good information, good analysis, what the right size of aggregation. Aggrega aggregation is 50,000 people, 100,000 people, 1 million, whatever. For instance, in many other experts, the regulator can give to the government all that information and say, you can decide better. Mm -hmm. Second, to support the government on legislation, saying, I propose you this legislation, or to change this legislation, or please take care with that legislation, which is not a good legislation. Mm -hmm and take care about uh, the capacity building of the sector, which is, I believe, not your case, but in, in our case, we train people. We train thousands of pro professionals. Mm -hmm. You need to deal with this and that and that and that, and it's free for them. For them. And last one, very important, to be responsible for the information in the sector. Now we produce every year one million data. All data is audited, and it covers everything relevant on water, wastewater, and solid waste. And that information is public. You can just ask the report, which is like that. <laughs> I do not recommend. Or just go to the site and get the Excel with all the figures. Or just put your or smartphone and, and click and say, I'm living in Sintra. Let me see the data about Sintra, the performance of my utility on water. It's good or not? Or not. If, if I, I see a red, uh, a red uh, dot, well, it's not good. A, a, a green dot, perfect. So this kind of information and how to transfer, for, uh, tra transfer information to different stakeholders is very, very important. So we developed that in a long, long process. And now we have a stable uh, situation where the regulator has a lot of powers, independence, and what is this independence? Independence means regulatory independence. In my, uh, my view, it means three things. We need to have what we call uh, uh, organic independence. So the, the board of the regulator must not, must not be removed because the new minister do not like my face or whatever. <laughs> uh, second, uh, functional independence. The, the minister cannot give us detailed instru instructions, for instance, well, take care with that tariff, not so high or not so low, or those data about quality, what the quality is not so nice to put it in the public, okay? Now, it's, it's not possible in Portugal, okay? Uh, and my colleague Francisco, he will be a speaker next, next session. We are good friends, but to, we had a period in our life, four years of overlap. He was the minister, I was the president of regulators. Okay, friends, but different business. <laughs> and we had a lot of discussions. And I believe it was a very interesting period discussing that with respect. He was the political guy. I was the technical guy. 
We never had real problems. Perhaps we agree a lot, we disagree in, in a few points, but it's a good uh, experience how to divide those two holes uh, and uh, how to succeed with that. So the regulator now is very stable with a very stable model with 12 years of data, 1 million per year, which are public. If you are studying in a university, just go there eh, and you get 12 million data about all the utilities in Portugal and you make your PhD on, with that because it's open data. And the cost for society is 0.7% of the average bill, which is very, 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 let's say, fair. Okay? So, uh, my final message. Any country trying to solve uh, water, uh, wastewater problems need to think uh, in a very sound public policy. And pub public policy, in my opinion, is this, I told you before. In that pu public policy, regulation is a very important piece or component. Regulation must be several characteristics. One of them is independence. Independence means uh, organic, I, and I forgot the third one, uh, uh, organic, functional, and financial. Uh, uh, regulator must not have money from national budget at all. Just taxes to the utilities, and utilities, by law, must uh, uh, transfer that for the consumers. So the consumers pay us. Mm -hmm. And we have a responsibility for all the 10 million of Portuguese, OK? Uh, and with that, you can have, let's say, a sound system. Mm -hmm. It's always difficult. We have always problems and challenge. But anyway, it's a, a, a solution I, I think can work in many countries with different models, of course, but uh, in many countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Francesc Trillas. Bueno, um, cuando termine Francesc Trillas, uh, pasaremos al debate, ¿no? Uh, aunque es muy tarde, por lo tanto, creo que lo más, lo más práctico será que el debate sea, sea telegráfico, ¿no? Uh, para que luego podáis seguir el la jornada con un horario más, más, más pausado. De todas formas, ahora es el turno de Francesc. Bueno, buen, buen día, buena tarde. Buenos días. Voy a expresarme en castellano porque deduzco que hay un excelente servicio de traducción a los que, por cierto, agradecemos mucho su, su trabajo. Yo voy a ser, voy a ser breve ¿eh? y voy a, voy a hablar de, de tres cuestiones específicas sobre las, sobre las que me puedo extender después en conversaciones privadas o, o por email eh, que están basadas en, en, mi, en mis trabajos sobre básicamente dos temas que son la independencia de los reguladores y la cuestión del federalismo regulatorio. Trabajos que he aplicado básicamente a los sectores de telecomunicaciones y energía eh, y que tienen algunas lecciones, no todas son aplicables directamente, pero tienen algunas lecciones creo para el sector del agua. Acabamos de escuchar dos intervenciones de, de dos modelos que, que funcionan bien, que son el modelo británico, más específicamente el, el modelo inglés y el, y, el modelo, y el modelo portugués. Creo que hay lecciones interesantes. Lo importante de las lecciones internacionales es aplicarlas y adaptarlas a la dotación institucional de cada país ¿eh? y de cada realidad. Esta es una lección de un economista importante de origen uruguayo, Pablo Spiller, que dice que los problemas de generar confianza para llevar a cabo las enormes inversiones que se necesitan, estos problemas de compromiso eh, y de credibilidad de la regulación deben resolverse de forma distinta en cada país, en cada realidad, según sea la dotación institucional, según sean las características complementarias del resto de instituciones del, del país, o de la realidad o la, de la jurisdicción. En cuanto a federalismo regulatorio, ¿qué hemos aprendido en líneas generales? Hemos aprendido que la homogeneidad en general eh, no es eficiente, ¿eh? lo que es eficiente es que los costes guíen la formación de precios, que los precios se fijen teniendo en cuenta el coste social marginal a largo plazo y esto puede ser distinto en, en, en distintas localidades, esta es una lección. Hemos aprendido que distintas unidades pueden servir para experimentar, es la idea del federalismo como laboratorio de la democracia, ¿eh? como posibilidad de intentar varias experiencias y aprender de ellas. Y también hemos aprendido que en distintas jurisdicciones las condiciones políticas puedan ser distintas. Por ejemplo, hay un historiador económico en Estados Unidos, Werner Trotsken, que ha estudiado la industria del gas 
en Illinois a finales del siglo XIX y llegó a la conclusión de que en Illinois y en otros estados de Estados Unidos la regulación del gas pasó del nivel local al nivel estatal no por razones de economías de escala, sino por razones políticas, porque era más fácil regular, dadas las condiciones políticas, a nivel estatal que en el nivel local. Por lo tanto, hay lecciones interesantes que aprender. Después voy a intentar llegar a alguna conclusión muy provisional para el caso español. ¿Qué sabemos de la independencia de los reguladores? Jaime ha explicado muy bien la experiencia, la experiencia portuguesa y que se entiende cuáles son los componentes de la independencia de los reguladores. La independencia del regulador es una de las formas, no la única, de aliviar ¿eh? el problema del compromiso de la regulación. Cuando el regulador es independiente, relativamente independiente del gobierno, puede tomar una visión más largo plazo, apartarse de la contingencia cotidiana de la política y, por lo tanto, fijar precios que den confianza a los inversores y, a la vez, ¿eh? que permitan pues que la, corregir el problema del monopolio natural y que, por lo tanto, las empresas no fijen el precio que maximizaría necesariamente sus beneficios. El regulador independiente puede servir para eso. Ahora bien, también puede servir para reclutar expertos, etcétera, etcétera, en sectores complejos tecnológicamente. Sin embargo, el regulador independiente también tiene inconvenientes ¿eh? o tiene limitaciones. Por ejemplo, esto fue estudiado por politólogos norteamericanos ya en los años 1950, porque en Estados Unidos fueron los primeros en implementar la idea del regulador independiente, ¿Cuáles son las limitaciones de la que, que deberíamos plantearnos a la idea de la independencia del regulador? En primer lugar, la necesidad, reconocida por reguladores independientes con visión a largo plazo como Jaime y otros, la necesidad de coordinarse con el resto del gobierno. Es decir, como ha afirmado Alena, la necesidad de respetar, de sentirse limitado por objetivos de política pública que no define el regulador, sino que se definen por parte de los gobiernos nacionales, regionales, internacionales, ¿Eh? Por lo tanto, la necesidad de coordinarse con objetivos de políticas públicas eh, más generales. Y en segundo lugar, una limitación a la independencia del regulador es que a veces el regulador va a necesitar habilidades políticas. ¿Eh? A, veces, a veces el regulador va a tener que tomar decisiones difíciles que tiene que explicar a la opinión pública, porque en una sociedad democrática al final la decisión es de los ciudadanos y por lo tanto el regulador va, va a necesitar habilidades políticas. No va, no, va, no va a ser necesario, no va a ser suficiente con que sea un regulador técnicamente excepcional y que conozca a todos los entresijos de la tecnología de un sector. Va a ser necesario también que, quizás, se mueva por los entresijos del poder para convencer a un político, a otro, para convencer a la opinión pública, para aparecer en un programa de televisión de forma convincente, para permitir redactar nuevas piezas de legislación que sirvan para resolver problemas. Eso no lo resuelve la figura mítica del regulador independiente tecnocrático. Eso requiere unas habilidades políticas que se obtienen en la política. Sin embargo, yo creo que la experiencia de reguladores como el británico, como el inglés ¿eh? y, el, y el portugués permite afirmar que hay ventajas, que hay esperanza ¿eh? en la posibilidad de tener reguladores independientes. Se ha hablado de federalismo regulatorio y de regulación independiente. Sería fácil decir ahora, bueno, pues ya está, ¿no? tenemos la solución, vamos a aplicar un federalismo regulatorio perfecto, ¿no? con cada nivel haciendo lo que tiene que hacer y vamos a meter reguladores independientes. Bueno, el problema es que esto es complicado. ¿Eh? El problema es que hay dilemas, dilemas entre un buen federalismo regulatorio y la figura del regulador independiente. Por ejemplo, hay dilemas tanto por arriba como por abajo. Por arriba el problema se plantea porque en instancias de poder supranacional, por ejemplo la Unión Europea, es muy difícil que haya un regulador independiente. De hecho, en España, por ejemplo, hemos importado calidad institucional y hemos importado buenas ideas, ¿eh? como la introducción de competencia y la protección de los consumidores desde el nivel europeo, pero no desde un, desde un regulador independiente europeo. Lo hemos importado desde la Comisión Europea, ¿eh? que está compuesta por políticos ¿eh? y políticas, por, perso por perso personal político, nombrado por consenso entre los Estados miembros de la Unión Europea. La política de defensa de la competencia, gracias a la cual en España los consumidores están relativamente protegidos, más de lo, que de lo que estarían si no estuviéramos en la Unión Europea, esa política de defensa de la competencia ha sido liderada por personajes políticos. ¿eh? El último de ellos, Joaquín Almunia. Es decir, personajes que vienen de la política, que se han formado en la política, que se han bregado en la política y que han terminado siendo comisarios europeos, que en algunos casos, como este último mencionado, yo creo que han hecho una buena labor. ¿eh? Y gracias a eso, nuestra política de defensa de la competencia es mejor. ¿eh? Por tanto, a nivel internacional, la figura del regulador independiente no es tan fácil, porque los acuerdos internacionales son acuerdos políticos basados en grandes consensos que se consiguen por la actuación de la política. Y en el nivel inferior, el regulador independiente también es una figura problemática, 
es una filial problemática. Y ahora ya bajo al caso español. En el caso español, ¿qué caracteriza nuestra dotación institucional? ¿Qué nos distingue, por ejemplo, del de Reino Unido y de Portugal? Nos caracteriza que somos un país enormemente descentralizado y fragmentado, por ejemplo, en el sector del agua. En España hay 17 comunidades autónomas con distintos niveles competenciales. Tenemos miles, ¿eh? no sé cuánto ha dicho Gonzalo, 8.000 y pico municipios. Tenemos dos grandes realidades metropolitanas, Barcelona y Madrid, con ambición y poder de dimensión internacional. Es decir, tenemos una realidad institucional enormemente compleja. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? ¿Vamos a crear, un, vamos a crear 17 reguladores independientes? ¿O uno en Barcelona y otro en Madrid? ¿O uno en cada uno de los 8.000 y pico municipios? Eso no es viable. ¿eh? La regulación específica, independiente o no, tiene unos costes fijos y no, no vamos a conseguir que todos los niveles administrativos tengan un regulador independiente. Por lo tanto, hay dilemas que resolver. ¿eh? Eso requiere estudiar, requiere consensos. En España no tenemos una experiencia muy buena en cuanto a reguladores de ámbito nacional. En España hemos tenido la Comisión del Mercado de Telecomunicaciones y la Comisión Nacional de Energía, que yo creo que hicieron una buena labor durante muchos años con sus pros y contras, pero que en un momento dado pues, el gobierno de turno decidió cerrar y fusionarlos en un organismo único junto con la Autoridad de Defensa de la Competencia, en un caso único a nivel internacional de fusión entre todos los reguladores sectoriales y la Autoridad de Defensa de la Competencia. Ahora parece que hemos rectificado precisamente a instancias de la Comisión Europea, vamos a rectificar y vamos a separar de nuevo la política de defensa de la competencia de la regulación sectorial, pero con la intención de mantener en una sola agencia de reguladores de red, por lo menos la energía y las telecomunicaciones. Quizás sería la oportunidad de que ese regulador, si es fruto de un consenso político, eso sería enormemente deseable, quizás sería la oportunidad de que ese regulador asumiera ciertas competencias ¿eh? en el terreno del agua. ¿Competencias de qué? ¿De fijar los precios? No. ¿eh? Los precios se sean fijando de una forma complejísima, reflejando la diversidad de la realidad española. ¿eh? Pero sí que un regulador a nivel español, ¿eh? si es fruto del consenso, si funciona bien, si se compromete no a, no a desafiar la autoridad europea, sino a implementar las decisiones que se toman a nivel europeo, quizás sea una buena oportunidad para que ese regulador hiciera cosas que no se hacen en este momento, como es una mejor difusión de información, un tener un foro eh, parecido al que tenemos aquí, donde se puedan reunir todos los sectores interesados y en un ejemplo de gobierno compartido se pudieran llegar a soluciones consensuadas que después se aplicaran por parte de los distintos organismos territoriales, quizás sería una gran oportunidad para que ese regulador hiciera tareas, eh, como por ejemplo llegar a consensos para presentar una voz única a nivel europeo, en fin, una serie de, de tareas, eh, básicamente de transparencia, de unificación de criterios, ¿eh? se pueden tener criterios parecidos, parecidos para fijar los precios y, lo, y que los precios sean distintos en todas partes. Yo estoy de acuerdo con que el precio del agua sea distinto en Barcelona al precio en Orense. Las características son distintas, el coste del agua, el coste social del agua es distinto. Me parece bien que haya precios distintos, pero quizás sería interesante para la opinión pública que los criterios fueran parecidos. ¿eh? Lo dejo ahí. Dos temas más eh, telegráficamente. Creo que hay que añadir una cuarta P a la idea de los PPPs, ¿eh? los Public-Private Partnerships, que en catalán y castellano, castellano se traduce como asociación o colaboración público-privada, pues habría que añadir una cuarta P, que es la idea de people, o sea, la población. Habría que añadir la cuarta P de la gente, es decir, hay que implicar a los consumidores, a los ciudadanos, a los contribuyentes en el proceso de decisión. ¿eh? Es dar contenido a lo que sería la agenda Akerlof en la economía del agua. George Akerlof es otro premio Nobel que tuvimos en un foro anterior de la economía del agua, está la charla en internet, en YouTube, ¿eh? hizo una charla fantástica, ¿eh? porque nos dejó un montón de deberes, de tarea a hacer en cuanto a implementar esa tarea de, entre todos, desarrollar un relato compartido ¿eh? que nos permita solucionar el problema del cubrimiento del coste de las inversiones necesarias para tener un ciclo del agua realmente eficiente, sostenible y equitativo. Y finalmente, última idea, hay que trabajar mucho más y hacerlo rigurosamente, pero hacerlo abiertamente y sin esconder nada, la cuestión de la propiedad y la cuestión de la interacción entre la propiedad y la regulación. La regulación y la propiedad son dos instrumentos de política pública, los dos son necesarios, ¿eh? y en ninguno de los dos se ha dicho la última palabra. En sectores monopolísticos, es verdad que, que se puede introducir competencia por el mercado y competencia en algún segmento del agua, ¿eh? pero en el mercado 
en el mercado, en lo que es la distribución, las redes de agua, el agua sigue siendo un monopolio local. ¿eh? Por lo tanto, la regulación va a ser necesaria. ¿eh? Y la propiedad pública monopolística no va a funcionar. Por lo tanto, la, co la coordinación, ¿eh? la, el hacer compatible la regulación y la propiedad va a ser necesario tanto si la propiedad es pública como si es privada. ¿eh? Pero creo que no tenemos bien estudiado suficiente el hecho de que si la propiedad es pública o la gestión pública o privada es una cuestión que no es aleatoria. ¿Eh? A veces damos la respuesta fácil, no, no, es que es igual, ¿eh? las dos cosas funcionan. Es verdad que las dos cosas funcionan, ¿eh? y hay ejemplos internacionales perfectos de que las dos cosas funcionan. Pero no es lo mismo. ¿eh? No es lo mismo. Y eso tenemos que trabajarlo. ¿eh? Tenemos que ver qué características tienen los, las poblaciones de gestión directa que funcionan bien y qué características tienen las, las poblaciones de, de gestión privada o concesionada que funcionan bien porque los hay. ¿Eh? Y son características distintas probablemente, pero no lo conocemos suficientemente. ¿Eh? Yo creo que es un tema en el que hay que trabajar ¿eh? y que hay que ser abiertos. Es verdad que ambos sistemas pueden funcionar y otros. ¿eh? Coincido con Gonzalo que hay que ser muy cuidadosos con las transiciones ¿eh? y en todo caso son, son cuestiones que hay que debatir de una forma transparente, abierta, sin miedos. ¿eh? Pero en Cataluña tenemos una mala experiencia en cuanto a una transición del público al privado. Aquí se ha privatizado mal. ¿Eh? Es fácil privatizar mal, ¿eh? también es fácil nacionalizar mal, y hay experiencias de eso en América Latina seguramente. Las transiciones hay que hacerlas, se pueden hacer, ¿eh? se pueden hacer bien o se pueden hacer mal. Yo creo que un debate transparente, ¿eh? bien animado por una buena investigación académica, ¿eh? puede ser útil para, para acomodar estos procesos y que en última instancia sirvan al interés común. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. No sé si hay más preguntas. ¿No hay más? Bueno, muy bien. Tenemos de momento cuatro, creo que de momento y, y, y definitivamente cuatro. Dos para Elena Kosakova, una para Jaime Melo y otra para Francesc Trillas. Elena Kosakova. ¿En qué medida o what contribuye a la eficiencia de los servicios del agua en un país donde estos están privatizados. Um, I think the answer is absolutely key. I think there wouldn't be any efficiency without us because we have privatized monopolies. So without us, they would behave like monopolies do and they would charge the maximum price they can they can charge. So it is our role to ensure that um, that the privatized monopolies charge a fair price, a price that allows them to recover efficiently incurred costs, which are costs that think not just about the needs of the current population, but also the population in the future. Um, and that the costs cover a customer service that customers want. Um, you can see that this will not necessarily lead to the lowest price possible. We may, um, uh, we may tolerate a higher price, but it has to, there has to be a rationale. And we go through an incredibly rigorous process where companies submit to us their business plans. We pour over them in a lot of detail. Um, and um, arrive at a final determination which, which says how much revenue companies can uh, recover. We have a revenue control, price control. It, I mean, it's, it's a form of price control. Um, so we say this is the maximum revenue you can recover. If they are super efficient, they can, they can keep the efficiency gain. Of course, it means that next time around we will look at it and say, hmm, actually, maybe we haven't been as Uh, as stringent as we should have been. Um, there are certain areas. We are being monitored by the National Audit Office, which is looking at our performance as, as a regulator. And they will not shy away from saying you have been um, a bit too weak, you should have recovered a bit more. So um, recently they told us we, sh we should have recovered more money, we should have lowered bills even further than we have done. I mean, it's a It's a question, we, we, can, uh, we can discuss that, uh, and we do. Um, if you look at our preparation for the next price review, we are looking at what we have done in the past price review and how com companies are performing against that. 
there are clearly areas where we might we appear to have been uh, a bit generous. So these are the areas where we, we may need to um, become a bit more stringent. Um, there are other areas where you know, we need more investment in resilience, so we might need to relax um, um, some of our um, revenue control rules. So it is a balance. We, we, have, we have a set of duties. Efficiency is one of them. As I say, without us, there would be private monopolies, so they would be charging a monopoly price. But we have to be mindful that we are regulating a business that has to be here, that has been here for 100 years, which is how old some of our networks are, and will have to be here in 100 years. So we have to ensure that companies invest in the network. Okay. Now, J Jamie Mello, we, we, will finish, we will finish with you. Uh, Jamie. Mm. Una vez creado el regulador, ¿cuáles son los principales retos a los que se enfrenta Portugal en el sector del agua? Big question. Well, uh, after, after that, uh, speaking about the regulator or the country itself, uh, everything? Having create, uh, uh, created the regulator, uh, which are the, 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 the main challenges for, for the, Portugal? For the? For the sector. For, for the sector, yeah. yeah. In the sector, after that uh, public policy, we can say, we solve our problem on water supply, quantity and quality which is not exactly true because we never solve anything. So we have a stable situation and we, of course, need to focus now on uh, asset management, for instance, not on investment, but for asset management. On wastewater, we still need relevant investments, capex, uh, because we need to move from 80% with collection and, and treatment to 90%. So we still have an investment. And, and again, asset management is also important. But uh, we also have two of those components, I told you before, of public policy, that we have not yet uh, solved uh, at all. The tariffs, because we start from a, let's say, dramatic situation. 400 utilities and spread between the lowest and biggest tariff in the country was that time one to 30, which is stupid. So uh, during the uh, first period, the regulator had no powers uh, regarding the municipalities, only the other utilities. So it was very difficult to manage with that. But in two, 2009, we got that responsibility regarding the municipalities. And then we developed an approach, uh, which uh, was quite well accepted and now it's being transformed, not, uh, it was a recommendation and now it will be a regulamentation, so it, it will be compulsory, saying for each utility, what is the process, the roadmap, to move from that situation, which was in many cases very low tariffs, even zero tariffs in, 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 in wastewater and solid waste, mm -hmm. to the right situation. And that roadmap start being uh, uh, applied by all the, almost all the municipalities, and many of them uh, uh, solved the problem. Nowadays, it's not 130, but 110, probably, and I hope it will arrive to 130, something like that. Uh, so this is a big deal, because a strong political uh, impact, uh, and there you need, <coughs> first, uh, give your face, not the president of the municipality, because he alone, for him, it will be very difficult. I need to go there as regulator and explain to the, uh, the municipal assembly why they need to change the policy. And so, second, avoid to do with this or that, but with all the region, because n nobody says that in my municipality prices are, are rising, but the others are still very low. So you need to, 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 to get both. Uh, approaches to solve problem, and we are solving problem. But this is, if you have zero tariff to achieve uh, three euros for water in waste water, you need some time. Okay, we are we are in that process. Mm -hmm. And the last one is that we solved our problem as aggregation 
in the sh we, what we call bulk systems, system getting water, treating water, and transporting water, it's solved now. We have no more uh, 400, but we have five big utilities. And uh, on retail service, which is distribution and connect with the, with the consumers, there we are still in process of aggregation. So a lot of incentives, namely regarding access to funds, was prepared to, to say to the municipality, if you want to stay alone with, let's say, 20,000 inhabitants, okay, it's a political decision, but it will be costly to you. And you will not have our support for that. You must deal with your problem. But you put together with other municipalities, you, you can find a minimum 100,000 people. Okay, you have incentives because you can access to this and that and that and that. And they are doing that in this moment. So I would say the main, main, uh, main uh, challenges are, are, are those. And perhaps the last one, never forget that those improvements are not, let's say, uh, it's possible they go back. And people in general do not understand that. Now we are good. Okay, but tomorrow you, you can be uh, worse. Mm -hmm. If you do not take care, even with regulation, okay? You made that the curve, but you can go down. So it's a continuous uh, work we need to, to do. Thank you. Francesc Trillas, para las administraciones públicas, ¿cuál sería el modelo ideal de regulación y el papel que éstas llevarían a cabo? No sé si... Bueno, no, no, no existe un modelo ideal. O sea, es más, la, la búsqueda de un modelo ideal yo creo que conduce a la melancolía. Lo que hay que hacer es ver cuál es el modelo adecuado para cada caso concreto. ¿Eh? O sea, hay, hay realidades distintas. O sea, el caso concreto de España, insisto, España es un país enormemente descentralizado, en algunos aspectos mal descentralizado, es decir, España necesita una, una profunda reforma de su sistema de descentralización, España es un país que está integrado en la Unión Europea, que está integrado en la zona euro, que no tiene ningún plan de dejar ni uno ni el otro, ¿eh? al contrario, España tiene la ambición, yo creo que con un gran consenso político y ciudadano, tiene la ambición de estar en la primera velocidad europea, es decir, que España va a estar más en Europa todavía, entonces, la, esta es la realidad española. Entonces, cualquier labor para el sector del agua tiene que adaptarse a esta realidad institucional y si no, no, no vamos a solucionar el problema del agua en España, lo vamos a, a empeorar. Yo me añado lo que dijo nuestro primer conferenciante del día, hay que buscar un balance entre la integración y la subsidiariedad y esto se hace en un, en un sistema de soberanías compartidas que es en, en lo que estamos y a lo que vamos más todavía. Gracias. And finally, Elena Kozakova. <clears throat> As a strictly economic regulator, how do you deal with the call for a holistic interdisciplinary water management? Um, how many sociologists, philosophers, do you employ? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very interesting question. Um, I mean, it is perhaps the most difficult um, challenge that we have as an economic regulator to branch out outside of, the, um, of our discipline to remain relevant without compromising the rigor of the analysis that we are applying. Um, we, we are bound by what the law tells us we can or cannot do. So the law tells us that we um, need to only focus on efficiency, um, but um, take account of all the other social um, goods that we need to protect um, by collaborating with other regulators. So this water resource management plan that we are working on in collaboration with the um, central government department, the environment agency um, and us. We all bring something to the table and we have to agree in the end. So it, it is a collaborative process. So when we decide whether um, we agree that a company should build a reservoir, we will not do it just based on um, 
our understanding of efficiency, we will try to understand do we need that reservoir for environmental reasons, and that will come from the water, water resource management plan. So these, um, um, our functions are at that level considerably more integrated than maybe I have um, given you the impression of. Um, You'd be surprised, I mean, how many philosophers do we have? We, we do not employ any, uh, but um, I think quite a lot of us would, um, um, would define ourselves as somewhat interested in, um, definitely in sociology, in philosophy, in a wider political science. I think you would find that all of us are very interested. Um, we keep up to date with late, latest um, academic thinking, we do invite people to come and talk to us and we do challenge ourselves continuously um, on the um, economic framework that we are using. But as I say, it is, it is a very careful balance because the economic framework we are using is very well defined, it's constantly evolving, but it is very rigorous. And uh, UK has moved from a world where we had a so-called public interest test applied across economic regulators. We've moved away from it towards more sort of pure economic regulation because there was a general perception that as soon as you start polluting this pure economic test, you are getting into a world of politics and less optimal decision making. Now I think, it's my personal view, we are moving closer towards greater integration and the public interest test is seeing um, a revival in many areas of regulation. So we are acutely aware that we don't live in isolation. Um, but as I say, we try to, we are bringing to the table our own tools. We are aware that the table is much bigger than many people sitting around it and that we have to communicate with them and live with them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, bien, yo creo que lo más, lo más práctico, si no tenéis interés en volver a intervenir, es, es um, invitarles en, uh, a continuar uh, el debate ahora, uh, Uh, durante la comida uh, porque ya son casi las dos y media half past three and uh, uh, past two sorry and uh, creo que lo más práctico es es que uh, el debate fluya de esta otra forma vale de acuerdo muchas gracias thank you very much